uh, let me give you a quick intro. It's uh, like I said earlier, it's it's great that we have such a wide diversity of topics to bring to our Sunday night meetings. We oftentimes focus on, you know, things that are really relevant to amateur astronomy, kind of what we do and, and the visual spectrum. Um, and so this is a this is kind of a refreshing little change here where we'll get to hear about a different part of the spectrum from a real expert. Um, Dr. Smith comes to us from the Center for Astrophysics up in Cambridge, Mass. It's part of the Harvard uh, Smithsonian uh, Institute um, uh, Center, and uh, he has uh, he got his degree from Carnegie Mellon. And then he also got, I believe you got your PhD up at the University of Wisconsin up in Madison, which is, uh, um, I've hung out there too for some time. It's a beautiful place. Um, and uh, and Randall's an expert in, in X-ray astronomy. And uh, there's so many cool things that can be discoverable with that, that uh, I'm sure uh, we're all going to learn something from it. And so I wanted to welcome you, Randall, and thank you so much for giving us your time tonight and I'll turn it over to you. Well, thanks very much for the opportunity. Let me just see if this works. Okay. And while he's getting that set up, which looks like he's having more success than I did, uh, if folks have questions, which I'm sure you will, just put them in the chat box. I'm going to monitor that throughout the evening and uh, you know if we need to we can ask Randall right there on the spot, but uh, it works pretty well to uh, to kind of collect them uh, towards the end. So, okay, over to you, Dr. Smith. Okay, well, thanks very much. And thanks, thank you all for taking your time out on your, your Sunday nights. Um, so I'm gonna be talking about astronomy with x-rays. And uh, I gave the talk the title, how, where, and most importantly, why. Um, I'll try to touch on all of this. Um, the talk ended up sort of having a historical flair to it, but I tried to, uh, to drift back and forth between the various uh, um, things as they happened and, and the technologies that we use as well. Um, now, one thing that I am all too aware of is this joke from uh, the XKCD comic um, that I think is, is uh, certainly apt. I have tried to keep this um, at a sort of, uh, I, would, I would call this uh, introductory college level um, but please don't hesitate to ask questions or, or save them up if I have uh, overshot at some point. So with that, and then I'll also just note one quick thing about the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. I actually work for the Smithsonian. So I, I am an employee of the Smithsonian Institution. Uh, and the Smithsonian uh, has a little known extra branches beyond the ones that you're probably much more familiar with there in DC. So in addition to the museums, we also have the Astronomical Observatory here in Cambridge. We have a uh, tropical rainforest study area um, in Panama. Uh, so we have a number of other institutions. Uh, as I was told the story, apparently, initially the astronomers who worked for the Smithsonian were down in DC, um, but they rapidly realized that astronomy in the DC area is a hard thing to do. So they decided to, to pick up sticks and move to the move north to uh, Cambridge and have never left. So <clears throat> as said, this is just my abstract. So I'll let you read that. I'm going to be talking here about uh, how things are done, uh, where the x-rays are coming from, uh, why we're interested in them, um, and you know what exactly we're talking about here in terms of the physics or the uh, um, the kind of things that we're looking at. So I'll be, and I, I put little helpful, I hope, uh, diagrams in the top right corner of each slide to let you know which one of these that I'm talking about now. But uh, the first thing I'll note here is that the x-rays that I'm talking about here are the same x-rays that you're familiar with here on Earth. Uh, the same x-rays when you go to the hospital and, and the you know, technician gives you an x-ray. Uh, these are the same kinds of x-rays, although these are a bit more energetic. So with that said, just to let you get things started. So this I'm sure you're familiar with, the electromagnetic spectrum. So all of visible light is here in this very narrow range here. And it goes quite a bit way down to radio waves, microwaves, all the way up into the X-rays and the gamma rays. Now, it might surprise you that there aren't actually official exact definitions 
of what these things are. Basically, x-rays are in generally in this region, but the boundaries are not particularly well-defined. It's just sort of wavelengths from between uh, 10 to the minus 8 meters to 10 to the minus 11 meters, which is basically, uh, I think of it as, as 100 angstroms down to uh, 0.01 angstroms or so. So that's a sort of visual description. Here's something that might help you out with just sort of understanding what it is that we're talking about. We can think of x-rays as either being wavelengths or as energies. And you know, you can always do this with electromagnetic radiation. You can always refer to either the, the wavelength of the light or the energy of the light. Typically, if we're talking about you know, radio bands, we talk about wavelengths or possibly even frequencies. When we're talking about optical light, we almost always use wavelengths. But when you get up to x-rays, we are starting to get to the point where we count individual x-rays. Each individual x-ray for us is something that we are, you know, lovingly characterize and study. And so we often refer to them by their energy. And so what that means here is I've given the conversions here between, so a 10 nanometer uh, wavelength is sort of the, the lowest end of the energy band. That's 0.1 keV is a unit that we use. That is relevant just because that's up the level where you can excite, but you can't ionize hydrogen. So that's a big deal for uh, professional astronomers because whether or not you can ionize hydrogen, the most abundant element in the universe, makes a big difference to how far an, a, a pot photon is going to travel. If it can't ionize hydrogen, then it tends to travel fairly far. If it can, then it tends to hit a hydrogen, ion, uh, hydrogen atom and ionize it. So then we go up to a little bit more to shorter wavelengths, higher energies. This is sort of typical energies for supernova remnants, stellar x-rays, what stars emit. This is the stuff that comes mostly from the galaxy. And the reason why you can sort of see here, and I put this in here, is at 1 keV, sorry, 1.24 keV, that kind of x-rays travels um, basically nowhere in air. So these kind of x-rays aren't energetic enough in order to go to be observed here on the ground. Our, our uh, Earth's atmosphere completely absorbs them. So this is why one of the things that's, that's typical of x-rays is you have to do them from space. And you have to go fairly far up in space. You can't just do them from a balloon because even a fairly small amount of air is enough to absorb soft x-rays. Even when you go up to say 5 keV here, which is the typical extragalactic x-rays, those only travel 20 centimeters, less than a foot. So then you get up to say the, the 0.1 nanometers or one angstrom, and that's about the highest energy you hit for cosmic thermal x-rays. So any process that is just hot gas, which is one of the things that creates x-rays, hot gas and supernova remnants, leftovers from supernovas, hot gas in the corona of stars, that's pretty much peaks out at around 10, 12 keV. In order to go through the human body, you need to go to more like 50 to 100 keV. So this is uh, the kind of energy that you might use for, say, taking a, a x-ray of your teeth or of use doing a uh, uh, x-ray in your arm. Uh, I think chest x-rays use more, um, more like 90 or so EV energies. And then when you get up to these kind of energies here, this is the edge of the, the x-ray band. Now you're talking about supermassive black hole type energies. This is what comes out of really extreme processes in the universe. So where did the field begin? Well, the very first astronomical x-rays were taken in 1948 and 49 using captured V2 rockets from World War II. So basically, as you probably know, um, at the end of World War II, the Germans had a bunch of, of rockets and they had a bunch of rocket engineers. And the US and the Soviet Union um, did a sweep through Germany, picking up everybody they could find and sending them back either to the US or to uh, Russia. And so we used a lot of these V2 rockets in order to do the early days of astronomy. And this was the first x-rays detected from the solar corona by Herb Friedman and his collaborators at the US Naval Research Lab. And you can see here, basically every time the rocket turned towards the sun, you got a spike and you saw x-rays. Um, now, I, I read some history of Herb's uh, 
experiment here, and he noted that um, for starters, the V2s worked about one every other time. So he got lucky and his first observation actually worked. But then he didn't really like using the V2s because they were so big that everybody and his brother wanted to get on your flight. So you didn't get to build just your own little experiment to go on your own rocket. You were always waiting for somebody else to finish their experiment, which is also going to go on the V2 rocket as well. So they all wanted to switch to other rockets in order to uh, do their experiments. I wanted to give you an example of where we are today. So this is 1948-49, measuring x-rays from the sun. This is an observation that was taken actually one week ago of the sun in x-ray energies. This is uh, actually sort of extreme ultraviolet or x-rays. It's 171 angstroms, but it's a pretty impressive picture of the sun. But this is taken every day, every um, um, <clears throat> hour, we get movies like this of the sun. And you can see you know, all the little flares and loops going around here. These are all magnetically confined loops of, of ultra hot gas here. And I just took these from this website, which is a NASA website. You can go and download that the sun was doing on anybody's day in a number of different band passes. I'll note, however, that despite the fact that we can now take this kind of data all the time, we're still not 100% certain what heats the stellar coroni to the millions of degrees that we see here. We know magnetic fields are involved, but there's still a lot of open questions. So I just think this is a pretty amazing picture. So next up, then we went from these looking at the sun to looking for x-rays beyond the solar system. Now, this was done in 1962, so a few years later, using a smaller rocket. This was launched on an Araby rocket, <coughs> which was more conveniently sized in the sense that they were able to do it uh, with, this was the only experiment on the rocket. Was uh, This was launched by Bruno Rossi, led uh, Riccardo Giacconi and their collaborators, and they launched an X-ray detector, but they didn't have a mirror. They just had it collimated. So they basically just had a big egg carton kind of, you know, uh, tube in front of it to um, cut off x-rays from pointing away, uh, from too far out of the field of view. And then they were officially looking for x-ray emission from the moon. Um, now, as Ricardo Giacconi later said, he told the, the Navy that was funding this that they were looking for uh, x-rays from the moon, um, but he had to look at the whole sky in order to make sure that he had enough background radiation in order to see it. And he admitted that really what he wanted to do was see if there were x-rays coming from anything else than the moon, or more specifically, the sun reflecting off the moon. Um, but the Navy wasn't going to go for that. They wanted to just know about things in, inside the solar system. But he figured he could uh, you know, take a look and see what he saw. And as it happened, as the rocket spun, it did see the moon, and you can see this moon, this is a little tiny blip here is the moon, but this giant increase here is a source called Scorpius X1, or it was named Scorpius X1 after they found it. Um, it turns out this is a binary star system with an M subgiant, a non-particularly you know, boring star, but it's outgassing and dumping mass onto a companion neutron star. And that neutron star heats up the gas as the gas falls onto the neutron star and gives it this consistent, very bright X-ray signature. So that is what they saw in 1962, and that got everybody very excited. There's some more about this, but I'll tell, talk about that in just a little bit. So where are we today? Or at least, you know, nowadays we can make movies of this stuff. So here is the, uh, the galaxy in X-rays, and you can see the galactic plane is along this axis here. This is the position of the sun moving along here. And you can see now SCO X1 is still there and very bright, but the center of the galaxy has all sorts of stars and, and things that are going around. Here you can see another neutron star binary in a 16-day orbit. So it gets brighter and dimmer as it gets closer and further away from its companion star. Here you see a microquasar. This is a black hole that's emitting here. <clears throat> so there are just stars all over the place. So now we're getting into the why. Why are we using x-rays? What's the point of looking at x-rays when it is much harder? You have to go into orbit. You have to, you have to launch a rocket. Um, why do we do this? Well, the answer is because in the x-rays, X-rays are a signature of the extreme. You have extreme temperatures. You have ultra strong gravities. And I mean the gravity around a black hole. Um, you have intense magnetic fields, often also around a black hole. Um, 
this kind of extremities means that almost all of the point-like x-ray sources are variable. So you can see that almost all of these are flickering. Um, that makes life somewhat challenging uh, because you never know what you're going to see until you actually get up there and look at it. So you can see that it turns out even some diffuse objects, like here the Cassiopeia A uh, supernova remnant, is expanding, and you can see it's even changing. So these are observations taken with Chandra over uh, a decade and a half. And you can see very slowly that this is expanding. Now, this supernova went off about 300, 400 years ago, and so it's still very rapidly expanding. Unfortunately, it's behind a fairly thick cloud, so optically it doesn't look all that impressive. But in the x-rays, you can see all sorts of cool stuff happening with it. You can see here, for example, there's a jet of material coming out here and a counter jet here. All of this stuff up in here is iron. This is silicon and sulfur that got blown out. So all the individual stuff in, the in this star has gotten blown out. You can even see the leftover precursor, the leftover neutron star or black hole. We don't know which one it is yet, right here at the very center of the object. So pretty cool stuff. Okay, so now back to the where. Now I mentioned already that this image already showed the Scorpius X1 and it showed the moon, which by that time they were much less interested in. They really wanted to see Scorp you know, SCO X1, but it turns out they saw something else as well. They saw that there is a constant X-ray background everywhere they looked in the sky. So this is not zero here. And they knew that their detectors were sensitive enough that this is an actual detection of something. Now, what they didn't know was whether or not this background is coming from the diffuse sky. Is it everything just glowing in X-rays? Or is it just a bunch of point sources that they couldn't resolve because really all they had was a detector with a tube in front of it? Now, this is a big deal because think about the cosmic microwave background. So this was 1962. In 1964 and five, only a couple of years later, Arno Penzias and Robert Wilson were looking at the cosmic microwave background. Rather, they were looking uh, <clears throat> at using a, a test uh, radio telescope, microwave telescope from uh, AT&T or Bell Labs at that time. And what they found was that there was a faint uniform noise in the background radiation. Everywhere they looked, the sky looked like it was emitting at a constant temperature of three degrees Kelvin. They could never get rid of the background. And after doing a whole lot of very careful work, it turned out that this is a signature of the Big Bang. This is the 3K radiation left over from the initial Big Bang. That got them the Nobel Prize. So the idea that, hey, maybe these x-rays are a constant background as well, was of great interest. Hey, maybe there's a Nobel Prize to be had here of where could that hot gas or whatever was creating these x-rays be coming from? So that led to a race to discover this. And in 1977, a few years later, NASA launched a telescope called HEO-1, High Energy Astronomical Observatory 1. Um, you really want to be careful when you're working with NASA that you uh, don't let them name the telescopes because <clears throat> they come up with really, really boring names. So they used uh, this telescope, again, using collimators. So again, just using detectors with tubes in front of them, uh, no optics to measure the whole sky between 2 and 20 keV. So keep in mind, these are still softish x-rays. These are x-rays that are not going to go very far um, in air, but they're, they're thick enough that they can go um, into uh, through the galaxy. Uh, and so these are mostly coming from extragalactic. Now you can see, again, the galactic center here is quite bright in x-rays. There's lots of sources up there. But for the rest of it, and it's not a great picture, but you can sort of see there's a diffuse haze here, a couple of individual point sources that you can pick out. But for the most part, it's pretty much constant. So the question was, is it really a diffuse gas out here, or is it a bunch of point sources that we just don't have the ability to resolve yet? So that led to a year later, NASA was really moving along quickly. They had a clever name here. This one is called HEO-2. And they launched HEO-2. Here it is pictured. And you can see it's you know, still getting bigger, but these things are now human-sized. 
bit bigger. This is the first one that had a real X-ray telescope. This is the first time that we launched a, a satellite with an X-ray telescope. And so now that leads me to this how question of how do you make an X-ray telescope? And so I'm going to take a short diversion here into X-ray optics. As you know, X-rays tend to penetrate materials. They don't reflect off them. But it turns out, like skipping stones across a pond, if you bounce them at very small, shallow angles, and the angles here are usually on the order of a degree or less, if you bounce them, they will in fact scatter. They will in fact reflect. So what you can do is you can make a mirror where you've got a paraboloid, your, your primary and your secondary here, and you just scatter them, and then you have a fairly far distance away from that, your focal point here. And that allows you to make an X-ray telescope. Now, I've got a movie here that shows this a little bit better than that. So here's the idea that if you try to make an actual regular telescope uh, mirror, you're not going to do anything. But if you have nested shells that have been very carefully spaced, all coated with reflecting materials for X-rays, which typically tend to be things like iridium and, and gold, um, then you can actually get X-rays to focus. And so here's an image of, uh, that I took from the Chandra team. Chandra is a major $2 billion X-ray mission that I'll get to uh, in just a little bit. And <clears throat> this is how you can actually make X-rays focus. Now, one thing you might be noting here is that if you've got these very shallow angles and, and <clears throat> then you're not getting a whole lot of collecting area, even though you're spending a whole lot of money, time and money making these very precise optics. And that is absolutely true. Basically, for every 200 square centimeters of reflecting area that you coat and make, you get about one square centimeter of actual collecting area at the end. So you've got a factor of 200 to 1 compared to, say, an optical telescope, where basically everything you put on there, as long as you have a good coating on it, is going to give you uh, optical light. So <clears throat> what did they learn? He, we launched TO2 in 1978. It was later renamed Einstein by the, uh, the scientists who were using it, not by NASA. Um, and that's the name it really goes by now. That was the first X-ray mirror. It had really good resolution, two arc second resolution. And they found that at least 28%, plus or minus 11%, of the seemingly diffuse X-rays were in fact coming from point sources. So here's a picture of some of the point sources that Einstein saw. And here's the paper. You notice it was headed by Ricardo Giacconi um, and a bunch of other people here at the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics who still work here. So Bill Foreman, Christine Jones, are still, Herman Marshall, are still working in the field, as is Fred Seward and Harvey Tannenbaum. All of these people uh, then said that really it looks to us like all of the x-rays could be coming from point sources, but they couldn't tell because the sensitivity wasn't good enough because the collecting area of the Einstein mirror was about the size of a silver dollar. So there's the actual telescope itself. In effect, this had the, the collecting area of something that you could hold in your hand, something like about the size of perhaps a uh, of half of a pair of binoculars. So the question really wasn't answered until we finally got to the point where we were doing something really big. Here is the Chandra X-ray Observatory. This is a part of what NASA calls the Great Observatories. You're probably familiar with the, uh, the optical version of it, which is Hubble. So Hubble was another great observatory, but Chandra was as well. <clears throat> and here you can see the optics are going to go in uh, to, uh, let's see, the optics go in this end, and then detectors are down here. Uh, Chandra was launched in 1999. It's still operating today uh, and has answered a huge number of questions about the universe. And of course, as all great telescopes do, it, answered, it opened up a whole bunch of new ones. So now I'd like to point out here that X-ray astronomers think big and have always thought big from the start. So here is, for example, a proposed 30 feet foot long orbital tele orbiting telescope. This is the design here. You have the, the optics down here, the detectors, and it, 
here, here's how it launches, and then it expands as it, after it launches. This was proposed by, again, Ricardo Giacconi uh, and a collaborator, Herb Gursky, only 15 months after that first rocket flight. So basically, as soon as he got that first rocket flight, which said that, hey, there is this extra galactic background, we don't know what it is, and we know there are point sources up there, he went to NASA and said, you know, we really need to launch something in order to do this right, and this is what it's going to look like. And this is what ended up happening in 1999. So it did take 33 years to go from this picture to that actual thing and $2 billion of U.S. taxpayer money. But it has answered a whole bunch of fascinating questions. So now we get to the Chandra telescope. And here you can see the some of the nested uh, parts of the Chandra mirror here as they're being installed into the, uh, the whole assembly down in here. This gets you half an arc second angular resolution, the best uh, X-ray resolution that anybody's ever made, and the equivalent area of a large dinner plate. So basically, I'm sure some of you own telescopes, optical telescopes, with more collecting area than what Chandra has. But this one works in the X-rays. So what did Chandra learn? And here I got a movie and I've actually got text. So I'm going to stop talking for just a moment and let you, you watch and listen. So the question's now been answered, uh, and it turns out that at least in the 2 to 10 kV bandpass, which is where a lot of the power is coming from, uh, essentially all of the x-rays are coming from point sources. Now, what are those point sources? And the answer is that most of them are very distant, supermassive black holes. These are black holes that are millions or billions of times more massive than our sun. They are more than half a universe away. And in many cases, what they're doing is absorbing material, having material from their galaxies falling into them, and that then creating outflows <coughs> that power um, basically giant you know, um, leaf blowers, you could think of them as, that are blowing gas and dust out of their galaxies. So it turns out that early galaxies formed stars like gangbusters. Early galaxies had huge reservoirs of gas and dust, and those, that gas and dust tended to collapse and to form stars, and these galaxies were hugely productive, making perhaps tens or even hundred stars, solar masses per year in new stars. And then at some point in almost all galaxies that we know of, the supermassive black hole at the center sort of turned on, started collecting gas and, and dust itself, set up this giant leaf blower outflowing jets, jets of material and blew all that stuff away. Exactly how and when that happened and why is still a question that we'd very much like to know the answer to. And Chandra's helped us in many regards, but has also opened up, just as I said, just as many new questions about that process and how it happened. So now, one of the things that we know is involved in creating those outflows is that black holes have spin. Turns out black holes are you know, fairly simple creatures. They have only um, three parameters, their mass, their spin, and their charge. Now, it turns out you can have a highly charged black hole where it's got a lot of uh, protons or a lot of electrons. But in space, basically, if it does that, it's going to end up collecting the opposite charge pretty quickly. So for the most part, black holes are electrically neutral. But they do have mass and spin. And we know their masses here. Their masses are in the uh, millions to billions of solar masses. But how fast they're spinning is an open question. And we'd love to be able to measure it. 
So here is a picture of uh, animation of looking at this. And we know that black holes like this have giant collections of gas and dust around them. And then at the very, very center, you have the black hole and it's sucking stuff in. And that is what is, let me show this one again. Um, that's what we want to see. We want to see this stuff here right at the very center. And it turns out that the only things that are being created down in this level are the x-rays. So if you want to actually see the black hole spin, you're going to have to look in x-rays, and you're going to have to look right down here at the very center of it. Now, we don't have any possibility of actually making an image like this. Um, you know, the, the Event Horizon Telescope made an amazing image of a black hole recently. Um, but <clears throat> x-rays aren't going to be able to do that. What we can do, however, is look at this spectrally. We can see the signatures of the gas as it's swirling around because the, the strong gravity here of the black hole actually has a fairly strong impact on what the spectrum of the x-rays looks like. Now, what does that spectrum look like? It's actually shown here. So if you have a black hole that is not spinning at all, which can happen, then you get a emission line here. This is coming from iron. And it's actually coming from iron in this disk around here. So this, this iron in this disk around the, these, the black hole is being lit up and emitting an emission line. And it's being bent by this gravity of the black hole itself and basically redshifted into a shape like this. So this is the spectrum of light that you would see from a non-spinning black hole. But it turns out, and this was actually worked out back in the uh, um, 80s, that if the black hole is spinning, then that Doppler shift here gets stretched down to much lower energies. And now that's if it's spinning with the gas that's going around it. Now you can get a weird situation where the black hole is spinning in one direction and the gas going around it is spinning in the other direction. That gives you a different kind of shape here. We've never actually seen one of those. It's just theoretically possible. So. Here's the one that we're looking to see. So if it's spinning quickly, you see this light gets stretched out a lot. And if you see this light gets here, then it doesn't get stretched out so far. But in order to see that, we need some spectral resolution. Now, so then <clears throat> here we're going to have a short detour into detectors and spectral resolution. So <clears throat> spectral resolution is the ability to distinguish between, say, one electron, one X-ray energy and another X-ray energy, or to distinguish between, for example, red and blue, or red and, and uh, <clears throat> red and yellow, or as my wife will sometimes give me, you know, very slightly blue and very slightly different blue, and promise me that there are in fact these are in fact different colors, whereas I can't tell them. Um, human eyes actually have a resolution ability to resolve colors at about a uh, a, a thousand. So we can see sort of one part in a thousand. X-ray detectors come in resolutions anywhere from one, which is absolutely miserable. Basically, you can't tell any energy from any other energy, up to, say, a resolution of 5,000 or so, which is even better than human eyes. Let me show you what that means here with the simulation. So I've got here two pl two plasmas. One of them is most is the dominant one. It's a hundred times brighter than this faint one down here. But there's a very slight difference. This one is an ionizing plasma, so it's say coming from a shock that just got hit, and this is an equilibrium plasma, so this is from an old shock. So maybe we're trying to distinguish the the shocked gas from the the all the other gas in say a, a supernova remnant, for example. So how can we do that? Well, at low resolutions, it's really hard. You can see that this barely shows up. As we go higher and higher in resolution, so we got now this is the kind of resolution you might get from a CCD. And now you can see that you can start breaking this up into emission lines. You can see some features are showing up in here. If we use a grating or a, what's something I'll talk about here in just a moment, a microcalorimeter, you can do even better. And as you get down to 3,000 to 5,000, you can see that you can really tell the difference just in a few places if you look in just the right spots between these two plasmas, and you'll be able to detect the two. But it really requires the ability to have that high resolution. So in addition to making X-ray optics in order to see finer and finer and resolve all of those individual point sources from the diffuse haze that we were looking at before, we also want to build detectors that have higher and higher resolution so that we can actually start breaking these light up into 
its individual components and really tell the physics about what's going on in here. So how do we do that? Well, the current detectors that are, for example, on the Chandra X-ray telescope are CCDs. And it's my guess that probably at least some of you have CCDs on your own telescopes or you've seen them being used in optical light. So <clears throat> X-ray CCDs work just fine. Um, now, one of the differences between X-ray CCDs and optical CCDs is that X-rays are powerful enough to detect individually. Each comes, we measure each individual photon as it comes in. It gets its own measured position, its energy, and a timestamp. The way it's detecting them in this case is the X-ray comes in, it dislodges uh, electrons inside the silicon chambers in here, inside the, the silicon wells in here, and then we read out those number of electrons and then estimate from the number of electrons that were ejected what the energy of the X-ray is. That gives us an energy accurate to about one part in a, in a hundred, so a resolution of about a hundred. Good, but not great. We measure time to about one second accuracy. And that allows us to make, for example, a spectrum that looks sort of like this. So you can see we can identify individual emission lines in here. So we can identify elements and we can tell what kind of plasma we're looking at. From this, we can measure what the temperature is. We can measure how much of the various elements are in there. You can see here this iron line that I was telling you was so interesting to be looking at for measuring black hole spin. That's the same kind of iron line. So with CCDs, you can make this kind of measurement, but it's a tough one. However, it's definitely good enough. Here is the very first measurement made of a spinning black hole. And you can see, admittedly, you know, it's a, the model fits pretty well. Um, there, you know, the data isn't quite as good as you'd really like it to be, but it's good enough. This was done with CCDs from a Japanese telescope called ASCA. And you can see that, yep, we can see the idea that uh, black holes are in fact spinning. Now, what we really want to do, though, is go to the next generation. These are X-ray microcalorimeters. And um, these were originally invented not as X-ray detectors, but as infrared detectors. And there's a story there that if somebody wants to ask me about, I can tell. Uh, but it turns out you can also use them to make X-ray detectors out of them. The trick is that you have to cool them down to about 50 millikelvin. And so that basically they're low enough energy that when one X-ray comes in, it absorbs into this uh, absorber here. You can see a picture of one here. And that heats up the absorber by enough that you can actually measure the change in the temperature. So that's why it needs to go down to 50 millikelvin, because one X-ray coming in has to be a big enough change that you can actually see something. Now, like CCDs, you can measure the X-ray position with these. But the time is now good to uh, 10 microseconds or so. and the energy resolution can be good to one part in a thousand or better. So you could really get amazingly accurate uh, energy measurements out of this, which is why we're so very excited about launching these. What can you do with that? Well, if you make a big enough X-ray mirror and put an X-ray microcalorimeter behind it, you can get to the point where you can measure that iron gas, not just uh, on average as it's going around, but you can measure it as the black hole itself is spinning. So here, for example, is a map as a function of time, and you can see individual particles of gas of the iron orbiting the black hole, and you can see it showing up here in these stretches um, going as a function of time. So this is time marching forward here, and you can basically see in the spectrum all of these features going through. The problem is, in order to do this, you need a giant telescope. You need an absolutely huge one in order to collect enough photons that you can make this kind of measurement on a second by second as it's going through. We have two telescopes that we're actually planning to build. We, one of them is in process. It's called Athena. And Athena is a European-led mission. It's got five arc second imaging, so uh, a bit worse than Chandra, but it's got more than a meter of collect square meter of collecting area. So Chandra has a dinner plate size collecting area. This is now we're up to the point of talking about, say, a card table. And Lynx is an even bigger one. We're proposed. So this one is being built now. Lynx is a proposed mission. We're waiting for the uh, next decadal review of astronomy and astrophysics to come out should be coming out any time now. This mission has been proposed to that review. If they say, yes, that's the most important thing for the next decade, then NASA has agreed to start building it. 
it would have half arc second imaging, a two meter collecting area, so two card tables, and a 100,000 pixel microcalorimeter on board, which would allow us to spear back and see black holes at the very dawn of their formation. So see black holes when they're very first forming. That'd be an incredibly exciting mission. And with that, I will finish up and be happy to take any questions. Yeah, thank, thanks a lot, Randall. It's super. Um, um, I'll give folks, a, I'll ask a couple, I'll give folks a chance to think through some of what you might have said too. Just, just basically on your last couple slides there with links, what was the, yeah, with that, with the slide you have up, I guess, links is the follow on to Chandra then? It would be the follow on to Chandra, yes. And so. it, but if it's still conceptual, I mean, Chandra is 20 years old right now, right? So when do you think that's going? We are hoping that if the, the current plans is if it's selected, then it would be launched sometime in 2035, 2036. Okay, so we're going to have a gap in coverage then. We are. Now, I will admit, if you, see, if you can see my shirt here, I'm wearing a <laughs> shirt that says Arcus on it. Okay. And if you Google Arcus X-ray, you'll find my mission. So we're I'm currently leading an effort to build one, a X-ray telescope that would be a grading uh, spectrometer. So it would do high resolution uh, spectroscopy um, using gratings. No imaging at all. Just so I, I didn't spend any time talking about that one. That one would launch if we're selected in 2028. Um, so we have high, we have hopes for a sooner one. The European one here is currently planned to launch in something like 2032. So we have some telescopes coming, um, and there's a German one. Uh, uh, not German. There's a uh, a Japanese mission uh, that's planned for launch um, end of next year. Okay, so these all look like big satellites. Is is there a move towards? Is the technology allowing anything other than what you've described in this paper? Or uh, oh yes, no. There's definitely a lot of interest in small sats, um, and there is a bunch of things that you can do with small sats. Um, so, for example, there's um, ideas to put on use a flotilla of small satellites orbiting the Earth. Uh, all with X-ray detectors in order to find transient events anywhere in the universe. Basically, to see um, put put see gamma ray bursts and what are called tidal disruption events. A tidal disruption event is a a boring name for an exciting thing. A, a TDE is when a star gets too close to a supermassive black hole and gets shredded. So if a regular star comes by a, black, a supermassive black hole, it can basically just get eaten alive and ripped apart. And that leads to uh, um, a fairly dramatic X-ray um, and signature. So that that kind of thing mm -hmm. is, is thought of with smaller satellites. <clears throat> Okay, uh, let me uh, let me go to the chat room here. Uh, let's see, Manjunath, you want to ask your question? I don't know if you're on mute or not, or I can ask it here if I if you need me to. But the the question uh, Manjunath had was uh, again just going back to I think what you said earlier is this everything we do in X-ray astronomy is from from outer space. That's correct. Yeah, we um, basically, um, you can do um, some ultraviolet work from balloons, and you can do some gamma ray, gamma ray observations um, from balloons as well. Um, but otherwise, you've got no choice but to, uh, to if you want to do real x-rays, you have to use, use satellites or rockets. There's just, and it's just because the, the atmosphere absorbs everything. I guess just a quick follow on to that. Is there, I don't know where Chandra is in, in orbit, if it's way out or if it's Earth, you know, at a Lagrange point. Does it matter where we put these things or we just need to get them out of the atmosphere? It's basically just out of the atmosphere is good enough. Chandra is actually in what's called high Earth orbit. Um, it goes, um, it goes in and out of the Van Allen belts, which was actually, it turns out, a bad choice. Um, it comes as, so it it's, goes out past the uh, um, geostationary oh. uh, and then comes back in again. 
-hmm. So uh, it's in a very high elliptical orbit. Mm -hmm. um, initially, Chandra was going to be in a low Earth orbit with the idea that you could imagine having a, you know, the space shuttle go up and, and do repairs if something was needed. Um, but it turned out that the uh, the ha we had to remove some of the mirrors, basically because the costs were getting too high. And when we got rid of some of the mirrors, that was going to hurt the efficiency of the observing plan and, and allow us to observe less. And they realized that they could basically go to a higher Earth orbit, give up the idea of, of, of repairing the mission, but you'd have much more efficient observing up there because if you're orbiting the Earth fairly low down, then obviously every so often the Earth gets in your way of what you want to look at. Mm -hmm. So if you go up high, then you don't have to worry about that so much. So they use the deep space network then to communicate with it? They do. Pretty much? Yeah. Okay. So let's see, George. George has a question for you. What is the temperature of the iron gas in a spinning black hole? Um, and uh, excellent question. <laughs> and our satellite lines of iron. Uh, okay. Um, this is definitely taking the... the, the talk off of the introductory undergraduate level. Um, the, George is a PhD physicist. Yes, I <laughs> Yeah, no, no, I, I, I've, I've used uh, the, some of the calculations that George did and measurements that he did uh, in, my, in my work. Um, and the answer is the gas is actually photoionized. Um, so the most of this is reflecting. So actually what we're mostly looking at is 6.4 neutral iron. So it's actually fairly cold. The disk mm -hmm. of, that's orbiting is, is relatively cold. It's probably only a few hundred degrees Kelvin. Um, and so the, what, what happens is the black hole jets um, have magnetic fields that we think have recomb recombination events and basically set off big bursts of, of light, which then photoionize the gas. And then we're seeing it in reflection from that. Um, the question of whether or not satellite lines are significant or not is one of those ones. Satellite lines, for, for those of you, it, are the other lines that can come around when you have uh, emission features going on. And the details of what's happening with the satellite lines has been ignored by most people on the grounds that we can't see them and therefore let's not worry too much about them. Um, one of the things that's really exciting about the microcalorimeters is that we're finally gonna have the resolution in order to actually look to see if, if these things are behaving the way they th we think they are. So um, it's an open question. The first real long-term microcalorimeter mission is launching with the Japanese uh, next year. Uh, if that works, um, we've, had, we've had some bad luck with earlier versions, um, then we'll finally know the answer to this question as to whether or not those satellite lines are important or not. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, I see the question here from Michael Robbins. Um, why did the first X-ray detector see X-rays coming from the moon? Does the moon reflect X-rays? And the answer is yes, it does reflect X-rays. Um, it reflects X-rays from the sun. Um, now you're right; it, it you know it doesn't reflect X-rays from the sun very well, but the sun is incredibly bright in X-rays, and the moon is incredibly big. So it doesn't have to be very good at it in order to get a few x-rays coming from it. Um, now, there's an actually an interesting story there. It turned out that we also saw x-rays coming from the dark side of the moon. And everybody always assumed back when they first saw that, that, oh, the x-rays coming from the dark side of the moon is just background noise. So that's just background noise in the detector. But it turns out if you actually looked at it very carefully, it wasn't consistent with the background from the rest of the detector that the background, it was, it was a bit higher than the background that you would expect. Now, there's no way to generate x-rays coming from the backside of the moon. There's nothing shining on it. So how did the x-rays get there? And it turns out the answer is actually that there are solar wind ions. So this is the solar wind, which is a hot gas. And as it flows past the Earth, it sometimes runs into other things, and those generate x-rays themselves via a process called charge exchange. And so now that process is being used to help study our upper atmosphere because watching the solar wind come through and then hit the upper atmosphere, Earth's atmosphere, it then creates x-rays and those can be used to study what processes are going on up there. So interesting fact about the moon. Um, comment about, I suspect the active oxygen in low Earth orbit would have chewed up the mirror coatings as well. 
Yes, in fact, that does cause problems. Um, if you're in low enough Earth orbit, um, then the not only does the oxygen get to be annoying in the fact that it absorbs some of your X-rays, it definitely does wreck your your mirror coatings. Um, that's actually a reason why, for example, until fairly recently, we weren't putting X-ray telescopes on the space station. You might think that an X-ray telescope would be a great place to put on the space station. But it turned out that shortly after the space station was put up there, the Germans actually had this idea of putting up a telescope uh, on, on the satellite on, on the space station. And they went so far as to put some coat some mirrors with coatings on them outside on the space station in order to see what happened. Uh, and they found out that after six months or so, they were completely corroded away. And it turns out that wasn't from the Earth's atmosphere. It's because the Soviet space manufacturing at the time used a lot of silicone gel, which tended to disintegrate on orbit. And so basically the entire space station was outgassing from the original building materials. Soviet procedures for building space stuff is entirely different from NASA's. So they had entirely different standards and basically all that stuff came off and was floating around the space station and ruined the mirrors. Um, so as a result, for many, many years, nobody put X-ray telescopes on the space station. It now turns out that basically all of that stuff has eaten away, has eroded away. So now we actually do have a telescope on the space station, two of them in fact. One, one is a Japanese mission called Maxi, and one of them is a, a U.S. mission called MICER, which has been measuring neutron stars and doing a great job. Um, okay, sorry, and then, then I, let's see. Does the time dilation from proximity to the black hole affect the calculations of the iron spectrum? Absolutely. Yes, the time dilation is part of the calculation. It's actually the entire space-time distortion that is doing that stretching. So all of those effects are coming into why the, uh, um, the light is being stretched out. And then, I'm sorry if I, I went through this too quickly, but the background radiation, so the microwave background radiation is from the Big Bang. That's absolutely correct. It, the question really was, is the X-ray background also related to some sort of Big Bang or something else, or was it point sources? And it turns out that the X-ray background is really just point sources billions upon billions of black holes all over the sky, whereas the microwave background is in fact from the Big Bang. So that's where the distinction lies. So. Randall, just curious on, you know, we, we as you said, you know, we, we're all familiar with medical x-rays and things. What, what kind of overlap is there with astronomy doing its thing with x-rays and the medical field, or are they really two separate, you know, <laughs> They're, they're really two separate fields. Um, basically, the kind of things that we worry about in, um, ex, in, in astron astronomical x-rays haven't been all that important to, um, to, uh, to the medical field. We do share a certain amount of work with high energy physicists. So for example, there's a group at Sandia National Labs that has a device that makes um, ultra hot plasmas. Um, and they get x-rays from that, and they're using some of our x-ray telescopes, to, uh, very small ones, in order to put into their experiments in order to collect x-rays. Um, and so there's some synchrotron facilities and, and laser facilities that use some of the same techniques and even use some of the optics. Um, but for the most part, we haven't, there just hasn't been much overlap in terms of, of what we need. Um, I think some of the data analysis techniques actually more than the actual hardware has been of use. You know, uh, contrast, image contrast routines and so on. Okay. What do you see like in the next, uh, I know we have like Chandra and then there's maybe a little gap or whatever. What are you looking forward to for discoveries? What, do you, what would you say is you're eager or anticipating this breakthrough? What would it be? What would it be? I'm really excited, like I said, this Japanese mission, um, which is called CRISM, X-R-I-S-M. Uh, the Japanese Space Agency is just as good as NASA at naming things. Um, CRISM is gonna launch next year sometime, we hope. And that will have a micro, the, one of the first long-term calorimeters with a X-ray mirror in front of it. That's gonna look at a lot of things like supernova remnants. Um, it's gonna look at 
um, supermassive black holes and see this, this spin that I talked about. Um, that has a whole bunch of possibility because it's the first time we'll have that kind of, of spectral resolution um, with a um, imaging telescope. Uh, so that's coming just next year and that's, that's really exciting. After that, my personally, I'm really hoping that we uh, uh, get uh, to build Arcus because if we can do that, then one of the things that Arcus is gonna be doing is looking at hot gas outside of galaxies. So we have um, one of the big questions that's remaining in how galaxies formed after the Big Bang is we know that they collected gas and dust and that all fell in. We know that that gas and dust after some period of time got blown out again. What we don't really know is how did it get out there? Where is it staying now? Did it, some of it never fall in? Where did it, is it really far away from galaxies? Is it near in? How hot is it? All of those questions are still very much open. So, you know, much like, you know, we know what's going on inside galaxies now pretty well, but on the outskirts of galaxies, which are pretty faint, we just don't know. And that's one of the reasons why we can really learn with, uh, with uh, X-rays and with, with my mission, Arcus. So, George, sorry, question? Uh, you do have the uh, one spectrum, though, of the extra galactic gas right in the Perseus cluster from the first Japanese microcalorimeter that been, been filmed on you, and that shows what about 100, about 60 million degree plasma out there. And you can see the satellite lines are down, so it must be very, very hot gas, and much hotter than a solar flare. That's correct. Yes, yeah, that that, that is the basically the one good picture we got from that satellite. Um, and uh, I didn't show the spectrum. Um, I do have it uh, here somewhere. Yeah. I won't, but it's, um, you're absolutely right. That's a much hotter gas. The satellite lines actually, um, funnily enough, um, in my day job, uh, one of the things that I do is I make the models that make predictions of what this hot gas should look like. So this model here actually comes from my calculations of what this hot gas would look like. Yeah. And the first microcalorimeter mission that George mentioned was called Hitomi. Uh, it launched and unfortunately destroyed itself 30 days after launch um, due to a series of unfortunate events um, that was really, really unfortunate. Um, and But it got this great measurement. There are two groups that actually make, um, make uh, X-ray measurements or uh, make, make these kind of calculations. And we disagreed on what the satellite line strengths were, um, which led to some interesting problems. Um, let me just, I, I mean, just, I'll show the spectrum here. Uh, give me just a moment. Uh, oh, shoot. It's going to. Any, any other questions while I'm uh, doing a quick search for this? Yeah, I had one because I can see the slide I was curious about. You don't have to go there, but the spinning, the spinning material in the black hole, mm -hmm. we're, we're, de we're detecting both the spin direction of the black hole and the gas from x-rays, and we can figure out if they're going diff in different directions? That's correct, yes. Okay. So the, the uh, yeah, so... This idea of a retrograde spin where it would be spinning backwards really would be weird. The only time that would actually happen is if, for example, two black holes merged and it, they just happen to merge in a direction where uh, one of them is now going backwards. And then you still have this, this uh, accretion disk going in the wrong direction. So okay, it's possible. You, you could detect that. with you, We haven't seen any like that, but we could we could detect them if they If, if they, they exist. Upon. Oh, yep. Okay. So here is the Perseus spectrum. And and so you can see here, actually, um, this is the two different codes. The red is my code, and the blue is the uh, my computer competition's code. And actually, um, George, the satellite lines are the difference between these two models here. And you can see actually that funnily enough, some of the data matches the blue curve and some of the data matches the red curve because nature was being very kind to both of us. But, but they're weak, they're very weak, which means the temperature is very high. That's correct, yeah. 
Yeah. So that's, a, that's amazing. <laughs> that's oh yeah. Yeah, no, this is a this is a great spectrum. The the, the loss of this telescope was just heartbreaking. Yeah. Well, there's been a great problem in finding a microcalorimeter on the Japanese mission. Right? I mean, how many I mean it's almost like there's a Jonah on. <laughs> yeah, there have been three so far. Yeah. The first one, the rocket failed and yeah. it went into the ocean. The second one, the detector failed because the, the cooling, the refrigeration system failed yeah. right after launch. Yeah. And then the third one, the rocket was mistakenly ordered to spin itself to death. <laughs> um, and it broke up into a bunch of different pieces. Um, so yeah, that was, we're now on to try number four with the Japanese being very, very careful this time. Good luck. Thank you. Yes, it's a it's a huge, huge effort. Who who's uh where are they launching? Are they launching that or are they buying a service from it's a no no they're they're thing. launching. They have a okay. they have a launch facility of their own. Yeah. And uh it's a space center probably. Yeah. 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 yeah Any other questions thing. for uh for Randall? Um pretty much on time, just a few minutes over, but uh appreciate uh Randall sticking around just a little bit to pick up some any any questions that anyone else may have? Certainly. No, this was, this was great fun. And uh, if anybody finds that they need any any more answered, um, Paul and, and George have my email. So yeah, it was uh, certainly great to have you, Randall. Like I said at the outset, you know, we, we tend to kind of focus on amateur, some amateur and a lot of space projects. Uh, uh, but certainly uh, don't deal a lot in different parts of the spectrum. So it's, it's I think, really good for, for us to appreciate that. And, uh, and uh, thank you for bringing it down to a level where uh, I won't say, I might have to go to George and, and ask him a few things offline, <laughs> but it was pretty close. I appreciate the, the, uh, the attempt there to bring it down to a level where we could all get some uh, good insight from it. So Huh. Uh, unless there's other questions, uh, I want to thank you, uh, uh, Randall, and uh, and for Novak members, uh, uh, help us out. Uh, we've got Star Stargaze coming up, as well as a bunch of other outreach opportunities, as I shared with you at the very beginning. So you'll see notices from uh, from either myself or, of course, uh, Alvin, our our um, outreach director. So a lot of fun stuff coming up. None of it's x-ray related, but uh, <laughs> maybe in the future. I don't know. So thank you, uh, Dr. Smith. I really appreciate your time. Thank you. Much appreciated. Bye.